So we're taking a look at humanistic ethics, the applied science of the art of living, which is chapter two of Eric Crumb's book, Man for Himself. Now, in that book as a whole, he's going to uh, try to work out his own theory of ethics and especially sort of bring that theory of ethics into a uh, sort of dialogue with a, a sort of uh, theory of psychoanalysis and the human personality. I'm really not interested in that whole big theory. Uh, what I'm interested in here in specifically chapter two is uh, some of the categories that Fromm lays out for us, some of the questions that he raises for us. And, and we're going to use those questions to really think more carefully about ethics over the course of this semester. Um, so what I want to do is just get started with the very first sentence of that chapter. Eric Fromm writes, if we do not abandon, as ethical relativism does, the search for objectively valid norms of conduct, what criteria for such norms can we find? Now, that, that sentence there is sort of itself uh, a little mini uh, version of the project that we're really going to take up this semester. But I want to kind of pick our way through that very carefully. Uh, let's, let's start with the, the core claim there. Uh, Fromm says that ethical relativism abandons the search for objectively valid norms of conduct. Now, you'll notice he really doesn't spend any time laying out ethical relativism. He doesn't spend any time explaining that. It's just this thing that he mentions right up front to dismiss. Okay, we're not going to do that, so what do we do instead? But let's, let's us just sort of pause there for a moment. Now, what does he mean by ethical relativism? Well, you'll get a sense of what that means already by uh, his claim that it abandons the search for objectively valid norms of conduct. Now, the word norm that appears in the middle of this sentence, it's a, it's a short little word, but I do find that it tends to uh, give my students a lot of trouble. And in particular, because if you look that word up in the dictionary, you're going to find three significantly different meanings of it. Uh, and in fact, Frome is using the, the older meaning, the one that's kind of gone out of use, out of fashion a bit. Uh, he's using the word norm in this sentence to mean a, a rule or a standard. Now, it's that meaning of the word norm that uh, connects it with the word that we talked about last lecture, normative. Now, remember, normative is, uh, as a, opposed to descriptive, is not about what is the case. Uh, it's about what ought to be, what should be the case. And so, of course, a rule or a standard uh, doesn't tell you what you are doing. It tells you what you're supposed to do, what you should do, what you must do, even if you don't do it. And so here's the important thing to remember. When we're talking about ethics, we are talking about uh, normative claims. Ethics makes claims on us. It tells us what we ought to do, what we should be doing, uh, how we ought to act even when we don't want to, even when we don't act that way. And so it's that oldest meaning, but now compare that with the other two meanings of the word norm that you're going to find in dictionary. Uh, norm most frequently these days when it's uh, used is simply used as a shortened form of normal. So whatever you typically do, whatever often happens, is the norm around here. Now that's certainly not the meaning that Fromm is using. And furthermore, that's certainly not uh, the meaning that we're drawing on in ethics. Just because you often do something doesn't mean that you should. Just because uh, things often happen, that doesn't mean they should happen that way. So uh, that's, of course, the, the most contemporary meaning. And then, of course, slightly broadened out from there, norm can just be uh, sort of what is uh, often the case for a, a group of people, or it can be uh, a kind of uh, statistical standard for a group, right? So what's the, what's the norm uh, height or weight for your age? Uh, you know, we can sort of track you 
basically comparing what you do or what happens with you to what happens in the average case. And we can add a whole bunch of things together, right? And this idea of just add a bunch of things together and see how you compare to the average person, that's a kind of a standard right? But even that doesn't get us quite as far as ethics. Because of course, just there, we've got a cultural relativism, which is just, well, here's how we often act. Here's what most people in my society do. And again, just because most people in your society usually do it, that doesn't mean that it's right, right? That doesn't mean that it's what ought to happen. So it's that oldest meaning, the kind of strictest meaning of norm, a, a rule or a standard that Fromm was talking about here. So when Fromm talks about valid norms, we're talking about the right rules. We're talking about the rules that really are the rules. And so here, it's, it's a matter, he says, of looking for objectively valid norms of conduct. In other words, rules of conduct, rules guiding behavior, rules telling us how to act and what to do that are objectively valid. So this, this matter of objective validity, of course, is going to be huge in this chapter. You'll have already noticed it. It crops up in just a couple of pages. Uh, Fromm is going to compare objective validity with subjective validity. Now, for subjective validity, uh, if something is valid just subjectively, that's to say that it, it works or it's right or it, it holds true only for uh, the subject or from within a subjective frame of reference. So uh, the way he's going to put that on page four is these bits of subjective validity. Desire is the test of value, he'll say. So what does it mean for desire to be the test of value? Well, if desire is the test of value, then in order for me to know how valuable something is, in order for me to know if it's good or bad, I turn inward and I look at the extent to which I want something or I desire something or I like something. So with subjective validity, desire is the test of value. And so if I like it, then it is right for me. If I want it to be the case, then it is valid for me. If I like this rule, if I decide this is how I want to behave, then that becomes a rule that's valid for me. But notice, just because I have set certain rules for myself does not make them objectively valid, right? They are, they just have subjective validity. And here's the important point that Fromm is making. If I just set my own rules however I want to, then of course, as soon as I don't want to behave that way, I can just set myself different rules. And so in this way, of course, I will never be wrong because in every case, I just do what I've decided I'm going to do, what I've decided I ought to do, and who is anyone to tell me any differently? So now it's in this sense that Fromm says that ethical relativism is the abandonment of the search for objectively valid norms of conduct. Ethical relativism is the default to just subjectively valid norms of conduct. Now, to put that in a more common way, I think the way we typically find ethical relativism is this idea that just because something is right for you doesn't make it right for me. And just because something is wrong for you doesn't make it wrong for me, right? And that, that sounds uh, compelling. And in many situations, it is compelling, right? Uh, I dress one way, but just because I dress this way doesn't mean that you should. Uh, I eat certain foods, and just because I eat certain foods doesn't mean that you should. And uh, I, you know, listen to certain kinds of music or watch certain kinds of TV shows, and just because I like these things doesn't mean that you ought to. But Here's the problem. When it comes to making ethical claims, uh, moral claims on one another, uh, I suspect even if you find yourself uh, very tempted by this position, there are just times where you, you want something stronger than that. 
I want you to imagine that you are crossing a bridge and in the middle of that bridge, you find a man standing next to a cardboard box. And this cardboard box is full of kittens. And one at a time, what this fellow is doing is he's taking a kitten out of the box, lighting it on fire, and throwing it off the bridge. And uh, I imagine that you would say something to this fellow like, what in the world are you to stop that? Now, when you say stop that, uh, I think you want to say something stronger than just, I don't like what you're doing, right? Because if it's just a matter of, I don't like what you're doing, then he says to you, well then, keep moving along, right? Cross the bridge, stop looking at me. And likewise, you want to be able to say something stronger than, I don't like that you're doing that, right? Or I choose not to do that in my life. What you want to say to this guy is, I think that you should not be doing that. And furthermore, when this fellow says to you, well, lighting kittens on fire and throwing them off bridges may be wrong for you, but it's not wrong for me. I suspect you would say to him, no, no, it's wrong for you too. You might want to do it. You might like doing it, but you're wrong and you should stop that, right? So that's what I mean by there are times where we want to make a stronger claim than just subjective validity. Now notice, there are probably already occurring to you a number of ways to try to get this guy to stop what he's doing without having to answer any of these tough ethical questions, right? You can just say, well, it's illegal, right? I'm going to call the police. I'm going to report you for lighting kittens on fire and throwing them off the bridge. but. Here's the thing, that doesn't fully get us out of the situation because in a democratic society, we can change the laws, right? So uh, we, what we've done is simply moved one step back from there. It's one thing to say that it is illegal to light kittens on fire and throw them off of bridges, but it's another thing to ask, well, should it be legal or illegal? And furthermore, I think that you probably don't want to say that that decision is just settled on how many people like engaging in this activity, right? Well, does anybody not like engaging in the activity? Is that a reason to outlaw an activity just because you don't like doing it? I mean, I don't really like riding bikes, but I'm not going to make it illegal. Right? And so again, we find ourselves very quickly reaching for moral reasons. Well, here's why it should be illegal to do that. And so there again, we need something stronger than just, I don't like it or I choose not to do it. And so despite its name, ethical relativism turns out to be no ethics at all. As Fromm puts it, ethical relativism is in fact the abandonment of ethics. Uh, it does not attempt to establish any objectively valid rules, any rules that might trump the subjective desire, any rules that might tell you that whatever you want to do is not the right thing to do or that you ought to do something else. In order for us to have a theory of ethics, Fromm says, we're going to need a theory that establishes criteria for objectively valid norms. And so again, returning to page four, the way he's going to put the matter of objective validity is just the flip of uh, the subjective. Objective validity is value as a test of desire. Now, what he means by that is when I have a desire, when I want to do something or when I want to not do something, for a value to test that desire is to say that I have some value according to which I can evaluate my desires. And so I have a desire to do something and now I ask myself, but should I do it? Is this okay? I'd want to do this, but is it okay to do this? I don't want to do this, but should I do it anyway? In order for there to be ethics, that we're going to have to have some outside way of testing our desires. 
because otherwise all I have is my desire to act a certain way. And I have no external position from which I can ask myself, should I do the things that I want to do? Should I do anything that I don't want to do? And so if desire is all we've got, then we've got no ethics. And in that sense, ethical relativism is no ethics at all. Right? I do what's right for me, you do what's right for you. I do what I want to do, you do what you want to do, and you have no way of telling me that I should do anything else. But for that matter, I have no way of telling me that I should do anything else, that I should do anything that I don't want to do. So ultimately, Frome's question in this very first sentence, the sentence that sort of lays out the whole project for us is, if we're going to go looking for objectively valid norms of conduct, rules, standards that can be used to detest my desires, uh, standards or rules that really are the rules for everyone or that somehow go above and beyond what we simply want to do. Then his question is, where are we supposed to find the criteria for those rules? How are we supposed to establish those rules? And so what you'll see from laying out right within the first two uh, or three pages of this chapter are really then kind of three categories that we can think about. The, the first, ethical relativism, is just the position that there is no such thing as ethics right? That, that ethics is impossible, that there is no way of establishing objectively valid rules for behavior. But meanwhile, the other two categories that Fromm is going to lay out are two very different ways of attempting to establish those objectively valid rules. And so these two kinds of ethics for Fromm, this is what he's going to call humanistic ethics and authoritarian ethics. Now, if there's going to be ethics, there has to be rules that apply to everybody, right? Those rules have to have some sort of objective validity to them. And so there it's a matter of those rules having some kind of authority. And so that's why right here on page one already, Frome is going into, he says, we think that it's a matter of having authority or having no authority, right? Uh, as in, there is some external authority telling me what to do, or there isn't, and now there's no authority. And Fromm says uh, that's actually kind of a, a false problem. The, the real issue for Fromm is a matter of what kind of authority those rules are going to have or draw upon. And so now he says it's a question not of authority versus no authority, but rather uh, a question of irrational authority versus rational authority. So irrational authority, as Fromm says, has its root in power over people. Irrational authority is backed up with the ability to punish transgression, and the irrational authority is simply the, the powerful uh, entity, the powerful person, the powerful institution and they can tell you what to do because they can punish you if you don't do it, they can reward you if you do do it. Uh, and so that is one way of imposing rules, right? I mean, think about the way any system of law works. Uh, and so, you know, think about something like speeding. If I am driving along uh, Interstate 30, uh, is there any reason why I should not go faster than 70 miles an hour? And interestingly, I can think of a bunch, right? I mean, it's, it's just not safe to necessarily go as fast as I want to go. Uh, I might want to go 150 miles an hour, but that's, that's unsafe. So there might be good reasons for me to keep my speed down, but here's the important thing. That's not why I have to, right? I can choose to do dangerous things. I have to keep my speed below 70 miles an hour, even if I think I can safely go above because the speed limit has been set by the state of Texas. Now, what gives the state of Texas the right to set the speed limit? Well, as it turns out, uh, they have the ability to punish me if I go faster than 70, 
right? So if I'm doing 90 miles an hour uh, along Interstate 30 and I go buzzing right past uh, a state trooper, that state trooper can, of course, flip on his lights and get behind me. And those lights are, of course, a nice way of asking me to pull over and accept the punishment. And now, of course, well, what happens if I say no, you know, I'm not going to pull over. Well, now, of course, I very quickly have two state troopers behind me flashing their lights and eventually perhaps a, a helicopter and uh, maybe a roadblock set up in front of me. And we very quickly got a high speed chase. But of course, at the end of this process, somewhere is the police forcing me to stop my car. They're gonna run me off the road. They're gonna, uh, you know, flatten my tires. They're gonna pull me from my car, probably throw me to the ground and handcuff me by the end of a, a long chase like this. They have the ability to enforce this law and that's why I have to obey it, right? I don't have to obey the law because I think it's a good idea. I have to obey the law even if I don't think it's a good idea, right? There, the law is still the law. That is a matter of irrational authority. And I choose the law as my example and a speed limit law as my example here, in part because I want you to notice irrational authority, this is not automatically necessarily a criticism, right? The question here is not a matter of good authority versus bad authority. If that's what Fromm meant, that's what he would have said. Rather, he puts it in terms of irrational versus rational authority because it's a matter of where that authority derives its authority from. And at the end of the day, any time that the authority is derived from power, that's what from means by irrational authority. And so to take another example, I want you to think about the kind of authority that a college professor wields. Now, if you are sitting in my class, if you are taking my class, if you're enrolled in my class, I have a certain authority, right? Uh, and that authority, I think we like to say, oh, well, that's a, that's a rational authority, right? You know what you're talking about. But after all, it's not the fact that I know what I'm talking about that tells you what you should or shouldn't do, right? When I tell you you have to take a test, or when I tell you you have to write an essay, or when I tell you that I, when I set an attendance policy, why do you have to follow these things? Well, if you are enrolled in my class, it's because I have the power to punish you for not doing these things, right? That punishment is, of course, a bad grade. And so I have an, uh, an authority derived from the institution, derived from the school. But that means even though college professor, that's got to be rational, right? The, the authority of a college professor over the students in their course, that is irrational authority. Now, I want you to compare the authority wielded by a college professor to something like if you have a personal trainer at your gym, right? You, you go to the gym and your personal trainer tells you, okay, uh, I want you to start by doing jumping jacks for a minute. Now, what happens if you say no? No, I'm not gonna do that. Well, the personal trainer might try to talk you into it, right? But can they punish you for not doing what they tell you to do? No, uh, they can just say, fine. I mean, it's, it's your money you're wasting, right? Uh, they can't kick you out of the class. They're not going to give you a bad grade. They're not going to write you a bad letter of recommendation. Uh, the personal trainer simply tells you to do something and you can decide whether or not to do that. In that sense, the personal trainer has no power over you. Now that said, does the personal trainer have any kind of authority? Well, I want you to think about why you hire a personal trainer in the first place, why you go to a personal trainer, why you might choose to do what they tell you to do. And that's because if you pick a good one, they have some training of their own, right? They have some expertise of their own. And so now you go to a personal trainer and you say, listen, I want to get into shape. What's the best way to do this? And from their position of expertise, they're going to tell you, well, listen, here is a plan that's going to work for you. Take my advice and you'll see the results, right? And so now you choose to do what they tell you to do. You consult them as an authority. Now notice that kind of authority, consulting someone as an authority on a subject, that is what Fromm means by rational authority. 
And so likewise, it's the kind of authority that your doctor wields, right? You go in and you get a checkup and the doctor says, okay, here's what's wrong with you. I'm gonna write you a prescription. The doctor can't punish you for not fulfill, fulfilling that prescription. The doctor can't punish you for not following their orders, but we still call them doctor's orders right? Because the doctor from that position of experience and expertise has offered you expert advice, authoritative advice. And so this is why you ought to do what they say. Notice the normative language comes in. You ought to do what they say because they know better than you do, right? But now, of course, to make sure you'll go get a second opinion, you'll look up your symptoms on WebMD, you'll do some other reading. Yeah. But this is why Fromm says rational authority has to be criticized, right? It's not just that it will tolerate criticism, it needs it. The rational authority will say, here's what you ought to do. And you say, why should I do that? And you should expect some good explanation. Here are the studies. Here is exactly how I know that you should do what I'm telling you I think you should do. Here's the basis. And I'm willing to show you the basis of my expert advice. Now, by contrast, irrational authority from says, can't handle any criticism. It's not just because it's thin skinned, right? It's because any criticism has to take the form of a challenge to that power. The police tell you not to go faster than 70 miles an hour, and you say, why shouldn't I do that? You know, you give me some good reasons. Of course, there are no good reasons. If you obey, then you're good. And if you disobey, then you're bad. And there can't be conversation about whether or not you should do this. Once the order is given, it is the order. And so this is why Fromm says the question for us is what kind of authority is ethics going to draw upon? Authoritarian ethics draws upon irrational authority. And that is even when you think the rules are good rules, what makes them the rules? What makes you obligated to follow them? And if the obligation is the power that the source of law or the source of ethics has over you, then that is irrational, that's authoritarian. By contrast, Fromm says, in order for there to be humanistic ethics, these rules are going to, be ha are going to have to be rooted in the kind of thing that you can have competence in such that when I tell you you shouldn't do something, you ought to be able to ask me, why shouldn't I do that? And I ought to be able to offer you good reasons. I ought to be able to show you reasons that I could expect you to accept. Here's why I think you shouldn't do that, and I'm going to show you why you should think that way as well. And I'm going to have to give you reasons that I could expect someone other than just me to accept which is why they have to not be just subjective reasons. I don't like it when you do that. An authoritarian system of ethics for Fromm is a, a system of ethics, a set of rules that is imposed from the outside, uh, arbitrarily ultimately will be his point, but imposed irrationally from the outside. And so, of course, as he will tell you, uh, for authoritarian ethics, you and I, the, the people governed by the rules, have no way of figuring out for ourselves what's right and what's wrong. And so what we need is just some external source of law to set these rules for us. Now, authoritarian ethics is, for us, going to be uh, a, a second trap that we're going to try to avoid all semester long. In other words, what I want you to think about is the question of humanistic ethics as uh, the question of how it's possible to have something that does not fall into either ethical relativism or authoritarian ethics. And so at the one extreme, ethical relativism says that there just are no rules that could apply to everyone. There are no rules. There is no way of establishing objectively valid rules, that all rules just have to be subjective. I decide for me and you decide for you. And so there's the one trap we're looking to avoid, the trap that just says ethics is impossible. 
But at the other extreme, the other trap we're going to try to avoid is to say that ethics is possible simply by having one source set the rules for everybody. And now everyone just has to do what that authority says. And of course, we can go looking for that authority in any number of places. We can find that authority in law, right? We can just give the government the power to tell us what's right and what's wrong. And now it's not a question of what should be legal. It's just a matter of, well, here are the rules and everyone's got to obey them. We can go looking for that source in religion, right? We just find some one external source, call it God or the church or the gods, and they set the rules for us. We don't know right from wrong. We have no way of knowing right from wrong. And so what we need is just that source to tell us, these are the rules, this is how you have to behave. Now, we talked about the problem of ethical relativism. Why is authoritarian ethics a problem? And Obviously, Frome has some things to say about this as well, but I think first and foremost, the problem here is that authoritarian ethics is ultimately, as I like to think of it, ethics for dogs. A good dog is an obedient dog. You say sit, the dog sits. You say roll over, the dog rolls over. You say don't use my living room as a toilet. The dog goes outside to use the, the uh, to relieve itself. And in the same way, we can think about good people and bad people as simply obedient and disobedient, right? There are the rules that have been set and you either obey them or you disobey them and that's what makes you good or bad. But notice the goodness or badness is not me, right? Uh, this is just whether or not I am doing as I am told by somebody else. And so if that's what I've called ethics for dogs, one way of putting my question this semester, the question of humanistic ethics is, is it possible to have something like ethics for humans? Ethics rules for people capable of thinking for themselves, of making independent decisions, of investigating things on, the, on their own without simply falling back into that other trap of ethical relevance. In other words, is it possible for us to all be equally capable of thinking things through and yet not have to say, well, that means that there are no rules that work for everybody? So the question here of humanistic ethics is how are we to find criteria for these objectively valid norms of conduct that aren't simply imposed by some external authority through the use of power, force, fear. Now again, Fromm has his own whole theory about how these rules should be established, what the specific rules are, how we should apply ethics. I'm not really interested in Fromm's answers this semester. What I'm interested in is this question that Fromm asks us. How is humanistic ethics possible? Or to put that another way, how is it possible to have ethics for humans? How is it possible for us to think rationally and independently about the rules we ought to follow? And can we find rules that everyone ought to follow? Or is all that we're left with what we individually want to do? And so in this sense, all semester long, we're going to be steering between, attempting to steer between two big traps. Ethical relativism on the one hand, this idea that ethics is impossible, all there is, is just you setting rules for you and me setting rules for me. And on the other hand, the trap of authoritarian ethics. There are rules for everybody, but of course they are rules for everybody because they have just been set by this one powerful external source, irrationally backed up with power. So the question for us is going to be, is it possible for all of us to come to recognize objectively valid rules that yet we can test out and figure out for ourselves. Things that we don't have to just obey, but rather things that we can come to understand and know and validate for ourselves.